younger. Number two, the pews were actually fastened to the floor. So when you walked on the tops of them, they didn't flip. Uh, these, it would be fun for about 30, no, not even 30 seconds. It'd be fun for about two seconds. And then I would be in a tangle of chairs and y'all would be looking down at me. You would be laughing, but I would not. All right. So is that working okay for you guys then? Fantastic. Uh, glad got that, got that worked out. I appreciate you guys jumping in and trying to get that taken care of for us. Okay. So Psalm 103, and the verse that we didn't spend much time on, as I remember, and I want to go back to, it's been on my mind, uh, not only personally, but also uh, doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, counseling with different people uh, this week. It's come up a few times, and probably because it's on my mind. But that verse is uh, verse number 13. Psalm 103 and verse number 13, and the Bible says, as, uh, like, uh, excuse me, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Now, I want to simply speak on, on uh, the subject of our merciful father, our merciful father. Father, I pray that you would help us tonight to absorb some more uh, truth about you. Lord, not new information, but reinforced truth to remind us not only who you are, but it is a call for us to be more like you as well. And Lord, I pray that in uh, everything we might give you praise and glory this evening in Jesus' name we ask, amen. As a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. The word pity here is uh, sometimes in our, in the way we use the word pity, uh, we might not get the right idea from it. We think of it sometimes as a, in a negative way. We say, oh, isn't that pitiful? Or is that, isn't that that, that guy is just pitiful, or that girl's just pitiful. And, uh, and we mean it in, a, in a, an unkind, maybe a derogatory way. But, but the Lord is full of pity. And the word for pity here is very often translated uh, in our uh, King James Bible uh, by different words. Uh, look with me. Let's just do a little bit of... of of study here and see how the same word appears in a couple of places. And then we'll come back to Psalm 103. So don't lose your place. In Lamentations, in Lamentations, and in verse number, chapter number three, chapter three, and verse number 22 and 23. <clears throat> it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. It says here, his compassions fail not. And it's the same, uh, comes from the same root as uh, the word pit, pity back in Psalm 103. It is so pity is compassion. Then uh, Psalm 116, Psalm 116, and verse number 5. Psalm 116 and verse number 5. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. So being Full of pity is the same as being full of mercy. It is, it is, it is a tender a compassion and mercy. And so, and then one more in Deuteronomy chapter 30, just to get a, a kind of a broad view of how the, the word is used. Uh, Deuteronomy 30 and verse number 3. 
the Bible says, that then, excuse me, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion on thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. So here's talking about, obviously, about the nation of Israel, and he'll return and gather them. Why? Because he will have compassion on them. So the idea of the, as a father pitieth his children, it's as a father has compassion and mercy uh, on, his, on his children, but the word pity also carries the idea of condescension. The word condescension, the idea of condescension is the idea of, of coming down to someone's level, to stooping down. We talk about the condescension of God when the Lord Jesus Christ came down and became man so that he could die for our sins. The condescension of the Lord. Uh, it's illustrated in the words of Jesus when he said, or excuse me, in the, the description of Jesus when the Bible says um, that uh, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, uh, the f- form of man, and uh, be, excuse me, the form of servant, and being in fashion as a man, uh, Uh, he uh, was able to lay down his life for us. And so the idea of the condescension is wrapped up in that description of the Lord Jesus Christ, condescending. That is important for us to bear in mind because if you are going to pity someone, have pity on them or have mercy on them. You are, uh, in some way or other, in a moral or a uh, uh, physical high ground in order to have pity on them. In other words, to pity them. As a father pitieth his children. He is their physical superior, He is their emotional superior. He is their intellectual superior. In all ways, he is their superior, and he pities them. Uh, It is when uh, when you have a church or a school or whatever it might be, and uh, you've got a wide range of ages. It can even be within a home. You have a wide range of ages, you know, teenagers down to to young, and those teenagers are the physical superior of those younger kids. And uh, if they are immature, uh, then they they use that. They you know bully the little ones or push them around or make fun whatever. And uh, and it's because <clears throat> they're 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 not mature in their own attitudes. And we uh, over the years we have tried to make. Uh, older young people understand that if you are, and you are, bigger, stronger, faster, all of these things, God expects you to use those uh, uh, abilities to protect, shelter, and guide and direct the younger ones, not in order to belittle them or, or you know, push them around or have them do chores for you or or, you know, threatening to beat them up, or whatever you're going to do, that's, that's a misuse of the blessings that God has given you. Uh, and we know that because God, the ultimate example of all of this, is God who is, would be able to snuff all of us out without so much as lifting a finger. He can create all this by the power of his word. He can destroy all this by the same power. He doesn't need us. He is in every way superior to any and all. He is superior to all people on the earth collectively. If you combine their ability, strength, knowledge, uh, accomplishments, whatever it is, it would not even come close to comparing to who God is by himself. He is then 
positioned to be the ultimate example of somebody that has pity on someone else. Because guess what? We need his mercy. We need God's pity. Um, we often talk about, you know, the, the different gods of this world and, and the, the man-made religions, man-made gods. And uh, every god that, uh, virtually every god that I can think of that man created is vindictive, hateful, mean, um, self-absorbed. And the reason for that is, just as God made man in his image, when we make gods, we make them in our image. And man is all of those things. Man is vindictive, uh, self-centered, egotistical, proud, all of those things is what man is. So man creates gods after his image. But what we need is a God that has pity upon us. Um, so let's go back to Psalm 103. And let's notice some, some of the characteristics of God that play into the fact that he has pity. And remember, the word pity means compassionate mercy. It's a loving compassion. Um, you know, it's like when you have a, a little animal or whatever, and you take, you're taking, you feel bad because it's injured or whatever, you're taking pity on it. You are in always, in every way, you are its superior. You are its intellectual superior. You are its physical superior. You are in always its superior and therefore, you can, and this plays into it, but you can then afford to be pitiful, to have pity on them, because they're just a dumb animal. They don't know anything. They don't have any resources. They don't have any way to, to uh, better themselves. They're just a dumb animal. And you can certainly, as someone created in the image of God, you can certainly afford to show pity upon a dumb animal. Amen. Now, you think, oh, man, preachers done gone animal rights. No, no it's nothing like that. Uh, but it, it is the distinction of having compassion or simple uh, pity upon a dumb animal. Now, that's the ones you're not going to eat, by the way. But anyway, maybe you did those a favor, too. You know, they could starve to death. <laughs> But the example is, is relevant for this reason. However high we are above those, those cre the creatures in the animal kingdom, in the animal world, however high above them we are intellectually, emotionally, with strength, power, whatever it might be, is not even close to how high God is above us. His ways are not our ways. His ways are higher, loftier, more noble. He is our, he is not our better by a small margin. He is infinitely more powerful, infinitely uh, more uh, knowledgeable, more intelligent. So why do we need a God that has pity? Because we need what God does for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The Bible talks about the Lord Jesus Christ being willing to come and become man and die for our sins. That's condescension. That's, that's willing to leave uh, the uh, position, if you will, the, the comfort, the the uh, things that go with all of who God is and come down to where we are so that he can take us from where we are to eventually be with him, to be where he is. To have that happen, he had to condescend. He had to, uh, the, the word condescend, think about this, the, the preface, C-O-N, con, means with, um, and descend to come down, to, to come down to 
where we are. That's condescension. And so it is the, it is the condescension, it is the pity, uh, the pity of the Lord that provides. We need his compassion. Compassion. Uh, by the way, when you are in a morally superior position, you can afford to have compassion on somebody else. If you've been raised in a uh, godly environment, if you've been raised, I've been, I was raised in a godly home, uh, father and mother, both Christians, my dad a pastor, obviously my mom a pastor's wife, had uh, all those advantages. You know what that helps me to do? It helps me to have compassion on men in prison who didn't have a stable home life. That, as, a, as one man related to me, his mother uh, married a man from Ghana. And he had deceived her into thinking that uh, he loved her, so she married him. As soon as they got married, then he was able to legally stay in the United States, and he took off. About the same time, someone, um, I don't, he doesn't even know why, but someone put something um, in something his mother was drinking, and it, and it, and it um, destroyed some of her mind to where she was not able to be uh, a mother, a housekeeper, uh, uh, anything like that. And so, and so she was gone. And, uh, and so... I mean, growing up with between this relative and moving across the state to that house, and and, then, and you know what, uh, I'm I have compassion, and I can afford to have compassion. Why? Because my my bringing upbringing was was infinitely better, infinitely better. So I can afford to be compassionate instead of saying, well, you know. You know, everybody's got to deal with something, you know, just get over it, you know. Uh, build a bridge and get over it, as a sign in my office somebody gave me. Just build a bridge and get over it. And, uh, and so, but, but no, I can afford to have compassion. Why? Because I've had more privilege than that. So you are coming when you have compassion, when you show pity, you are coming from a, a, a standpoint where, where you can afford to do it. It doesn't cost you much. And so God is our example. And then uh, why do we need God's pity? Because we, it, the other word for pity is mercy. We need his mercy. And you know, all of these things are things we should show to others. Uh, let's go back quickly to Psalm 103. And think about God's tenderness, God's pity upon us, uh, illustrated by, uh, and by the way, if you look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can see the tenderness, the pity of God the Father displayed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you've known me, you've known my Father as well. So why, why does God pity us? Uh, God's patience with us is seen all through the scriptures where God has not always um, done, done to us what our sin deserved, right? Uh, notice in verse number 8 of Psalm 103, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Notice in verse 10, he hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. He talks about in verse 12, removing our transgressions as far as the east is from the west. And so, his pity for us is seen in the fact that he has not always done to us what we 
deserve. Amen. Well, I just want what's coming to me. I do not want what's coming to me. I want what God's grace provides for me. Um, the idea of, well, I'm just going to, you know, I've had people say over the years, well, I'm just going to do this to them because they've got it coming. Well, maybe they do. But if you are in such a morally high position, can you not afford to show some mercy, to condescend, to show some pity? And so, like as a father pitieth his children, um, so God pities them that fear him. Um, God is not always judged as he could. Now, is God the judge of all the earth? Absolutely. Is there a final uh, judgment to be, to be had? Yes, there is. But God would have been righteous in doing it already and not giving man a chance. God would have been. But he has not done that. Why is it that we talk about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? We long for it. But why does it linger? Why is it not here? Doesn't God love us? Doesn't God care about us? Doesn't he have pity on us? And why doesn't he come? Well, because the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, balance out your desire to be out of here with the realization that God is showing pity on the lost. God is showing pity on those. Hey, listen, um, you know, I was talking to a pastor uh, recently, and we're talking about the fact that, you know, you're trying to help people that, you know, they, they have all kinds of big, big issues. Some of them homeless, some of them drugs and alcohol, some of them uh, mental disorders. So they're unstable. They're, they're like water. Uh, meaning they're just, you can't, I mean, they're just, you just, they just run all over and you, you, you end up chasing them around and, and, uh, and that's, why do you do it? Why don't you just let them go? Because we have pity. Because we are trying to show mercy to them. We're not holding them accountable for everything they say and do. We're instead, we're realizing that, listen, everybody has to start somewhere. Everybody has to start somewhere. And, uh, and so uh, let me say also, not only do we need God's pity because, uh, because of our condition and our situation, uh, I want to say also that he is in a position to show such pity. Why? Because he is in every way our superior. So we have our shortcomings, Right? We have our failures, right? And God could simply just write us off, move on to the next person. But what does the Bible say? Instead, he chastens every son whom he receiveth. Why? Because he desires to correct us. He desires to help us. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Amen? Great is thy faithfulness. And, and it is his, his goodness that helps us not be completely destroyed. Then I'd say also uh, he, is, he is, has pity on us because he knows who we are. He knows our frame. We spent a little bit of time on this when, I, when we were talking about bless the Lord uh, recently. But notice in verse number uh, 14, he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. As for man... His days are as grass. As the flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. Uh, and he goes on there. But notice, we need his pity because we are dust. We are dust. There's nothing in us that has any value other than what God places on us. 
um, he has decided that he wanted to put, put his love on us, so he, uh, he uh, placed a value. What value did God place on you? What value did God place on me? It's easy to see. Look at the cross. Because that's what he was willing to pay. So that the Holy Spirit of God passed through my life when I was 21 years old and I trusted Christ as my Savior. And God at that time put a seal upon my life that said paid in full that keeps me, that protects me until the redemption of the purchased possession. I am, other people may be confused about it. I am not. I am not confused about where God found me. And, uh, and he knows as well. And yet, he chooses to allow me to serve him. That's pity. That's mercy. That's God's grace. As a father pitieth his son. And I'd say the Lord has pity on us and no word maybe in the Bible, no word brings home the truth of God's loving kindness than the word pity. That he has compassion on us. There's love and mercy and condescension all tied up in this word pity. It, it, is his, it displays his condescending love. It's the love of one who is infinitely our superior, as I said, and, and patient on the one hand and, and enabling on the other. It's as though he is with one hand enabling us to move forward and on the other hand, waiting to receive. It, it, it's, it's, like, it's like little kids in church on, on Sunday. Um, we, were, we were talking about this after the service this last Sunday. In, the, in uh, Phil and Jennifer's church over in Michigan, they have, a, they have a, uh, a, a thing on the platform where the kids put money for camp, right? Miss Jennifer, and so when it gets time for for a church, and the kids are used to you know you know they get money from adults and they run up there and put it in and whatever, and uh, but they have to get the money from the adults you know and so um, and so on Sunday you know um, Master Luke back there he was excited about the offering you know and so um, he's getting money from Grandma and Mom whoever he can get it from back there and just and just chomping at the bit till the until the, the usher could get back there where he could put it in the plate, because here we don't run up to the front to do it. We're way too dignified for that. And um, uh, and so it's just so there's just like holding him back, holding him back. But but it's you know, anything we do for God is just like that. He has to give it to us for us to have it to give. It's not that, oh, you know, look at all these abilities that I have. And I'm going to choose to, dis, to serve the Lord with some of them. No, I have no abilities apart from that which God gives me. That's pity. When God says, not only will I, not only will I supply the ability, I will accept your service done with it. Not only will I supply your finances I will accept it from you as you give it. That's condescending mercy. That's pity. The pity of God is condescending love. Pity of God is understandable because of who he is. And think about this. What do we have that we could possibly do that would please God? The Bible says, hey, if, if your sacrifice could be pleasing to God, uh, he'd have pleasure in it. But he said, take no pleasure in that. 
What, it, what does God take pleasure in? The humble spirit, a contrite heart, a broken spirit, right? That's what he responds to. You know what that is? That's recognition that we have nothing except what God puts in our hand. We need God's pity because it enables us to uh, serve the Lord in a meaningful way. Accepting God's pity is recognition of our failed humanity. What do I mean our failed humanity? I mean God made Adam, made Eve, put him in the garden, and they sinned. They sinned. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed by all men, for that all have sinned. We, have, we are sinners. We have nothing to bring to God, nothing to impress him with, but we hold out our hands to a loving God who provides for us that which we can give to honor him. That is pity, as a father pitieth his son. So let me go back to Psalm 103, and we'll uh, wrap this up. So when you read in uh, chapter 103, and really anywhere in the Bible, about God's mercy, um, the whole reason to bless the Lord, notice in verse number three, who, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. He executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. Remember what we're talking about? Pity for all that are oppressed. Uh, and it goes all the way down through. But notice down in verse number 17, but the, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. So we can and should bless the Lord. What are we doing as we acknowledge God's goodness? We are responding to his condescending love. We are, we are responding in a, such a way that we are acknowledging his greatness matching up with our unworthiness. His supply with our lack. His strength for our weakness. I want to encourage you to think. Uh, you say, oh, you just, where did you come up with that list? Listen, they're Bible examples. Paul with the thorn in the flesh that prayed that it would be removed. And what did he say? He said, when God said, my strength, my grace is sufficient, he said, then I'll gladly rejoice in it. Why? Because his strength, God's strength, is made perfect in my weakness. When I'm weak, that's when God's strength comes in. So God's condescending grace. We have nothing to offer him. He supplies something to us that we can in turn glorify him with. Our ability, our time, our um, service for him. Our families, our homes, our, our mental capacity. Uh, my prayer every day this week, part of my prayer for my walk with God has been twofold. Number one, that I would go through a day with an un... Um, now I'm going to forget exactly what I... Mm, and, and not an undistracted, it's not the right word, an un... Oh, I just lost it. Basically, a, um, an, an undistracted attention on God. I, I can't think of the word I'm trying to come up with. What? Und, no, well, no, but that's a good one. Undivided. That wasn't it. I, I think I just accidentally deleted it. It was on my, because I've been looking at this every day all week, uh, all this week. And, but I think I just, uh, I think it just got taken off or I'll, I'll look at it here. But yeah, it just got taken off of my to-do thing. 
but it was an undivided, um, un, un, yeah, it's going to bug me till I think of it, but an undivided attention on the Lord the, to go through a day, through the day, and not have big pieces of time where I am not conscious of his presence, aware of his goodness, aware of his word, and, and have that undistracted attention undistracted attention. And, and then secondly, um, to have a, a, um, an undiminished trust. To end the day trusting God as much or more than I did at the beginning of the day. It has been uh, the desire of my heart this week as I just try to focus on a couple of things in my life each each day, each week. It's been my desire this week to, to have those two things uh, consistent uh, throughout this week. I have a busy week, and I recognize that. And I said, Lord, I don't want to forget in all the running around, all the business, busyness, I don't want to forget not only who you are, I don't want to forget your presence. I don't want to forget your goodness. I don't want to forget your supply. I don't want to forget your strength. And I don't want to end the day trusting you less because of some event that happens. Say, so, oh, that's, that's, yeah, well, you know what that is? That's, that's recognizing the pity of God, the mercy of God. I'm depending upon him. And he, by the way, he can afford to show pity because he is so, he's not diminished. He's not diminished. We think, oh, if somebody wrongs me and I just, I just say, you know what? Let's not worry about that. I'll just forgive that. We think somehow we've lost something. But you haven't. You've gained something because you're displaying the goodness of God and the pity and the mercy of God to those around you. Bless the Lord. Why? Because he is a merciful heavenly father. So I'd say this. The verse we picked, I picked for the Bible study tonight. As the father pitieth his son. What does it say? So uh, the Lord pitieth them that who? Fear him. The Lord pities those that fear him. You might be saying, well, how do I get in on God's goodness? How do I get in on God's mercy? Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Ha uh, develop that relationship with God that elevates him to his rightful place. And God will have mercy. Amen. Father, I pray that you would help us as we have tried to take a truth from the word of God and try to illustrate it in ways that will be helpful and useful to us. God, in all these things, may Christ be lifted up. May the, the spirit of God be able to work in our lives and may you be exalted in all these things. God, we want to give you the praise and the glory for it. Thank you for your mercy, for your condescending love, for your pity upon us. With our heads still bound and our eyes still closed as we stand to our feet and the piano begins to play.